Good morning. My name is uh, David Brown, and I'm here on the edges of the Oyster River with Father Charles Brandt. And we're going to have a conversation about some of the things that Charles has done in his lovely long life. And his, his, he's just an amazing man. And so, Charles, your business card, I, you know, that I've looked at a number of times, your business card talks about you being a paper restorer, an ornithologist, a photographer, and so many other things. That's, it's just amazing the things that you have done in your life. And what's most appealing, if you like, or, or most such a part of the story is that you're a hermit. Now, can you tell me a little bit about being a hermit and how that started and where you came from? Okay, David, I, I came from a very large Benedictine monastery back in Dubuque, Iowa. And this was the time of Vatican II, uh, which was from 62 to 65. Everybody was trying to discover their roots, where did we come from? And monks were also trying to discover that. And we discovered that the um, first monks were hermits in the uh, desert south of Alexandria, down the all the way down to the right. Thebes, 600 kilometers. And at the time, there was something after the Peace of Constantine, which was in 613, uh, sorry, 313, there were about 5,000 hermits living in this area. So they were the, really the first monks. And so during Vatican II, we were looking at our roots, and we discovered that we came from the hermits. A very simple life along the Nile River, mm -hmm. um, li living uh, very simply. And so there was a big strong movement in, in Benedictine circles uh, to reestablish the hermit life. And so there was a Benedictine monk from um, Belgium, Jacques Vinandi. And he got permission from Bishop of Victoria to make a foundation of hermits. And what, what year? This was when? in 65. And so I heard about them. Um, they came in 64, actually, very time that the Mount Washington mine went in, mm -hmm. in August of 64. I came in 65, about six months later. I got permission from my abbot to come out and visit them because we were interested in the hermit life. And so that's how I arrived on the scene, uh, on the Solon River on Vancouver Island. There's so many questions that came up to my mind just as you were saying all of that. Um, I'll come back to the uh, Solon River in a, in a, in a moment. Uh, how did you, well, how did you establish your hermitage there and then also how did you get into paper conservation and book binding and all those marvelous things you've done? Okay, then once I came out here, then I discovered that I had to build my own hermitage, which I did. We're living in the, the same building that we moved it up from the Solon to the Oyster River. This very building, I tore down a house and got a lot of the lumber, the shiplap and studs and so forth. Cedar came from a mill out on the dike came between Courtney and Campbell River. And then I moved up here. Um, before I moved, we had to make a living. So I had a little bit of background in bookbinding. I had learned bookbinding when I was coming into the Catholic Church okay. in Oklahoma. I spent a year at a Benedictine monastery there. And I learned a little simple bookbinding. So I thought that would be a good way to make a living. So I wrote to some monks in Lafayette, Oregon, and they sent me some simple equipment, like a guillotine, a sewing frame. And uh, so I was in business. Uh, and then mm -hmm. once I'd set up my hermitage, uh, bookbinding, uh, at the end of the 65, I was looking for clients. 
And um, there was uh, David Muir, who was a, a warden, fisheries warden. And Not the David Muir. Pardon? Not the David Muir. No, no a different <laughs> one. Okay. And he used to come out, and we used to have these chats. And so I said, well, I'm looking for bookbinding clients. And he said, well, there's this Roderick Hake Brown in Campbell River. He has this huge library. Um, so, so eventually I went up to visit him uh, at the old um, RCP on station. Mm. I want to, no, I, I want to stay with the paper conservation idea. Oh, How did, no, okay. or, or the oldest book that you've ever bound and restructured that you can remember, because you've done some amazing stuff. Well, I did the uh, Nuremberg Chronicle. That goes back to about what, 1750 or so. Mm -hmm. It's probably the oldest book. Um, probably the most important book was Audubon's Ornithology, which was more recent. That would be about 1830, but that's great value. This is, um, I have a number of his prints around. Not original prints, but Audubon's Ornithology. When I worked on that, um, it was worth about well, $5,000. And then the time it had finished, it was worth about $12 million. This was the worldwide market for Audubon's ornithology. So you weren't able to collect any of that part of it then and Not really, live no. a, no. a non-simple no. life on the That's right. Oyster River? Yeah. yeah. No. Just, just the binding of it. Yeah. Now, what about the paper conservation? Because you talk about conserving paper, and it doesn't. Well, well do very when I got water. into bookbinding, um, you know, books are mainly paper. I discovered that I had to learn. I didn't know very much about paper, and so I had to learn something about paper. So I had a sister friend, sister Catherine. She told me about. New England Document Center in Massachusetts, and a, a Dr. Cunyon was there, and he was a paper specialist. So I wrote to him, could I come and study with you, and I would do some book pointing, and you would teach me paper conservation. So he invited me. So I went there, and I was still living the hermit life, only a, a little bit different life, and then I was there for two years. And then I also wanted to learn more about fine binding, how to do designs on binding. Mm -hmm. And so I had to go to Europe for that. And so I ended up in Ascona, that's in Switzerland. And while I was there, I was there for about a year and a half, I received a letter from the National Museums of Canada, would I like to be interviewed as a book paper conservator. So they flew me back to Ottawa and I was interviewed. So I got the job and so after I finished the work in Escoda, I went to Ottawa. Mm. And then I went to Moncton, New Brunswick, that's where they had one of their um, subdivisions. Wow. And so I did a lot of work with paper. Right. So let's make kind of a quantum leap from that to here we are today on the, on your Oyster River. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what's it like to be a hermit or by yourself and living here in this spot for what, 15 years now? How many years now? Well, actually, uh, I moved here in, in 70. Okay. So that'd be 30, about 50 years almost. And 30 years ago to this spot? Yes, in this spot from, uh, you know, from uh, 70, 30 plus 16. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is that, 46 years? Something like that. Yeah, something yeah. Else. I'm, I'm so what is that? Tell us, a, tell us a bit about your life and your thoughts and your Okay, so, so the eremitic hermit life is primarily a life of contemplation. What is contemplation? It's very difficult to define. I mean, all of life is beautiful to look at, and you step out on the porch and 
look at the sound of the river and look at the forest and uh, so there, there are two communities. There's the human community, which you and I belong to very much, and then there's the other community, more than human community, greater community, which is made up of the plants and the soil um, and uh, all sentient beings. Uh, so that's all around us, is more, more than human world. So contemplation is maybe partially looking at that and rejoicing in it. Um, uh, and then I would d define contemplation as an empty, imageless prayer in which the naked act of the will reaches out to God, not as we imagine him to be, not as we see him in his works, but as he is in himself. So it's a naked act of the will reaching out to God. So very simply, that's what con contemplation or contemplative prayer is. So I spend maybe a couple of hours a day doing that, just maybe sitting out on the porch or at my desk and um, quietly uh, lo looking at God as he is in mm -hmm. himself. Now, what good does that do? Well, obviously think, it's done pretty well for you <laughs> in terms of... I think it does good for everybody, mm -hmm. the whole human community. You know, we're moving at such a very rapid space, pace, uh, you know, uh, society more and more hectic and more and more television, uh, more and more computer and uh, meetings. And so I think for a few people to move off into the wilderness, into the desert, and, and just to be alone with God, that helps everybody mm -hmm. uh, because we're all connected. We're connected to the natural world. We're connected to the human world. We're connected to every other being on the, on the planet. Absolutely. What, you know, D Dave uh, Muir, uh, the other Muir, says you break a twig and that affects the most distant star. Everything is connected, you know. Mm -hmm. Everything is, mm -hmm. even this meeting we're having right now is connected with every other being in the, in the universe. Yeah. I've read that uh, Bishop Remy Duru has said, Charles Brandt is on a continuum from contemplative to articulate. Okay. And I like, I kind of like that, that right. description. I think that says so much about you. Yeah, by the way, he was here yesterday and he left those books sit on the desk there. Okay. Um, and he has this one little book, it's kind of uh, with his notes in it, and they go all the way back to Vatican II, 62. Uh, 65, he was in Rome for that. And he's a really an outstanding person, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. Very brilliant man. Um, you know, I've had four bishops since I've been here. Remy ordained me and ordained me to the hermit life and to the priesthood. And then I had another bishop uh, uh, from Manitoba I uh, can't think of his name right now, and then Bishop Gagnon, and then the present bishop. Uh, so four different bishops, they're all different. Uh, bishop Remy was a scholar, and uh, uh, Bishop Gagnon was more of a classical person, scholar. Mm -hmm. And the present bishop is very pastoral. He has kind of a truck that he carries with him his dog. He came from the Yukon where he was bishop, and his dog saved his life twice. So he takes care of that dog. Well, I make well, sure I brought the dog with me all the time then. That's a, that's a good story. That's <laughs> right, yes. So the dog is always with him, you know, wherever he goes. Good. So I said I'd, go, I'd get back or go uh, switch back into the Solom River and Mount Washington Copper, and you and a number of the other people, of course, in Courtney were just... Uh, doggedly determined to do something about that. And I remember reading a letter, I think you sent into the minister, saying, the Solom River is dead. 
That's right. So pick it up from there. Yeah. Okay. Well, in 83, 84 it was, only nine pink salmon returned to the um, Solon River to spawn. And um, so the manager of the hatchery said, oh, I don't have any broodstock for, you know, with nine salmon. That's not, not broodstock for two years from now. So the Steelhead Society, the local chapter, and under the inspiration of Rob Bill Irving, you probably oh, remember him. Yes, yeah. He was the provincial chairman. He encouraged us to do some work on the mine site, to reclaim the mine site, and to enhance the Solom River. What was, what was killing everything? What it kind was, of a mine was it? It was copper from the mine. Um, we, um, see, to get back, and there were only nine pink salmon returned. So they had a meeting in Campbell River, and Wayne and White was there, and um, several other prominent uh, biologists. And at that meeting, the, Francis Bueller wrote this up in the green sheet paper, and that was it, the Solar River is dead. And the reason it was dead was because of the pop copper from the mine polluting the river. There was over 100 micrograms per liter of copper in the, in the solum. And so the salmon pinks just couldn't abide by that. What normally would kill salmon in either pinks or, or fingerlings? Or? Well, it's down to less than seven now, and they could live with seven micrograms. So we wanted above seven. And so gradually it's been coming down from 100 to 50 to 25 to less than seven. It's probably around three micrograms per liter. Good. And that isn't bad, that's fairly healthy. So I just thought of this question. How much money did the Mount Washington copper mine make out of this and how much money has gone into the restoration of their completely irresponsible part of mining? It was a sort of a Japanese uh, development and I think, I can't remember how much, I think they made very small profit from the ore they hauled down the island. But the government, to, with the Steelhead Society, put in a million dollars. And then later, the provincial government, in 80, in, in, um, a little later, put in about four and a half million dollars. So altogether, Ten million dollars has gone into that copper mine to reclaim it. And you're, when you're at the top of Mount Washington in the summertime, and you look down on this still huge, big, bare patch, it's not that big. That's right. It's you know? yeah. It's just a, it wasn't the whole mine. It was just the northern part of the mine that was causing the pollution. Mm. Mm. So what they did, they put a cap on it, a membrane over the top of it. Mm -hmm. And so that prevents any rain water getting down yeah. into the ore. And then on top of that, they planted it with soil and plants. Mm. So it's, um, two years ago, instead of nine pink salmon returning, there were 130,000 pink oh. salmon returned oh. to the river. 130,000. That's amazing. It is yeah. amazing. Yeah. So I want to shift a little bit in our conversation. And you, you've said before that you were good friends with Rod and ha Anne Haig Brown. Right. And she was a good friend of ours because she was the librarian at Cary High. Right. And uh, Measure of the Year is one of his very favorite books because it, he writes about family and months of the year. And this is May. And he has this lovely description about the carpenter ants coming out right. in May, right on cue. So, Tell us a little bit about your friendship and how you met Rod Haig Brown and Mrs. Haig Brown. Well, as I, I think I may have said before that I was looking for clients for bookbinding, and right. um, Father Cunningham drove me up in Campbell River. He, uh, Muir had told me about uh, Roderick Haig Brown and his library, said he'd be a likely candidate. So I went into the RCMP station and said, I'd like to speak to Roderick A. Brown. 
and he was uh, doing uh, some kind of a trial. So he came out, he was wearing his magistrate's robes, and a very, he had a very fierce look about him, I thought. And I told him what I was up to. I was a bookbinder, and I just moved here and been about a year, and I was looking for clients. And so that, he didn't, we didn't really discuss that very much, but one thing he did tell me was that he was a professional writer. That's what he wanted to be known as a mm -hmm. professional writer. Well, he and ended up with 28 books. That's right. And about only about five of them were about fishing. There, was that I didn't realize that. Yes, yes. It was amazing. Okay. So I, I, had, I had never read any of Roderick Ed Brown. I, I didn't know he was a writer. I didn't know he was a fisherman. Okay. I, I just knew that he had a library. And um, so later, later that day, I went to the high school where he used to teach, mm -hmm. Cary High, and I said, I'd like to speak to the librarian. So they brought out Ann Hay Brown, and she, we had a, just a hilarious time for about an hour ch talking and laughing. So relaxed, much more so than Roderick, you know, <laughs> much more so, I would say. Uh, that could have been my fault, but... And then she, uh, she told she invited me around uh, to the house that evening, which I didn't go because I had to get back. Um, and then later, I, I thought, well, another client might be a lawyer. So I went to a law office, and I didn't know which law office it was. And it turned out to be that it was a law office that Valerie, husband, was... To the, they, they ran it together, yes, I guess. Right, right. And I remember Valerie, she was, I've seen her since a number of times. She was quite skinny. She was wearing a red dress. And uh, they didn't have much of a library in the law office. And I thought, well, they're a little bit hard up. You know, they're, I felt they were. <laughs> Love it. And <laughs> just because of the lack of, of books. Sure. Um, but it was, uh, so I met in that one day, sort of, not accidentally with Rod, but the other two, kind of accidental. Uh, all the, the people who really were book people in Campbell River, uh, Rod and, and Valerie, all mm -hmm. just, just in one day. What an amazing day. And I was going to spend the night in the church. They had facilities above the, uh, in the chapel. But then uh, um, Ray Cunningham drove me home. Right, right. Hmm. Uh, we've got a few minutes left, and I just want to uh, sort of add in about we used to have carry high staff meetings in the library right. at the house. Those were the wonderful heydays of Anne Haig Brown and John Young, and it was so stimulating, and it formed my, you know, philosophy of education so much. So, but it's not about me, it's about you. And so I want to end with a, a quote here that you've talked about. It says... Look deep into nature and you will understand. Oof. Hits me. Uh, you will understand everything better. Can you finish up with that? Yeah, okay. Well, you know, the, the, the Catholic Church and other Christian groups have what they call a preferential option for the poor. You know, that's what Jesus was concerned with, the poor people. Primarily, he was concerned with the poor people. And so the church has a preferential option for the poor. So who, who, are, who, is, who are the poor? Um, we think of the people not making a very good salary. But one of the philosophers, uh, Thomas Berry, says that the poor people are really the culturally disparaged people. And what he means by that, we say to one group of people, you have no value, you have no dignity. Mm -hmm. We've been saying that to women. Uh, we've been saying that to First Nations people. You know, you have no value, you have no dignity. Yes, yes. So if we have preferential option for the poor, then we have to restore their dignity. We have to restore dignity to women to the First Nations people, other people who have lost their dignity, the other poor of the earth. And that, that especially replies to, 
to the earth itself. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we've taken away the dignity of our rivers, our forests, our mountains. So we have to restore mm -hmm. that dignity. I love that, Digni so, the dignity. So yeah. how do we do that? How do we restore the dignity? We do that by experiencing creation with a sense of wonder and delight rather than a commodity for our yeah. own personal benefit. And interestingly enough, we have just under a minute left in this conversation. Okay. Can you sum yeah, up I'll your... Su I'll sum it up. In your okay. 97 years and 45 seconds? I, I can, okay. <laughs> so uh, we have to make a transition from our society, right. which is having a disruptive influence on the earth to a society that has a benign presence to the earth. And we do that by falling in love with the natural world. Now, how do we fall in love with the natural world? We have to experience the natural world. We have to go out and look at it. And we, we only love something um, if we think it's sacred. So in a sense, only the sense of the sacred will save us. That's a perfect ending. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.